Welcome to another episode of Stuck in Middle Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Reflex. And I'm Sir Charles, aka Capo. Hey, man. Welcome to the desk, bro. Yeah, I'm back, man. Yeah, man. we recorded this on a Thursday because our guest, our special guest, we're going to introduce him in a minute, is here from North Carolina. Appreciate you making the trip, bro. We're going to introduce you in a minute, but definitely want to take care of some housekeeping. If you are checking Stuck in Middle Podcast out for the first time on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the ringer so you get updates every time we drop something new. This is a platform for entrepreneurs, innovators, move makers of African descent, where you hear stories, ideas, and advice on how we can break the mold, how we can break barriers. This particular episode is sponsored by our online store. We appreciate the support. So if you hit sitmpodcast.com, backslash store, you shop stuck in middle podcast merch. That's how we're able to drive this machine forward. You heard? And also, we are on all social media platforms, SITM Podcast. That's at SITM Podcast, Instagram, YouTube, all that good stuff. Charles, man. You excited for this jump? Yeah, man. You know, it's a real interesting topic for me. You yeah, know man. What it's mean? different. It's different. Yeah. It's different. Listen, we have the pleasure of speaking with a structural engineer, a STEM educator, social entrepreneur based in Raleigh, North Carolina. He is he has over eight years of experience working for NASA, but he is currently he currently works a bridge as a bridge design engineer at Simpson Engineers and Associates. Please, please welcome Nehemiah Mabry to second the podcast. Gentlemen, up, gentlemen. Oh yeah. man, oh man. Flex Charles. <laughs> the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much Appreciate for coming call. on a Thursday. Yeah, man. What, what has you in DC though? You know, I know you didn't just fly out here for us. Yeah, hey, well, you know, I would have. I would have. <laughs> it just happened to be a, a conference going on. Uh-huh. A, a STEM emerging researchers in STEM conference down in DC. So uh came out here for that, man. Got a session I'm doing and mm-hmm. I'm just loving love being around good people, man. Being around my people. Yeah. How are you involved with it with a conference? Yeah, so I'm doing a session on STEM entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And so we got like over fourteen thousand students from different uh, minority serving institutions as well as graduate students who are gonna be presenting posters and research as it relates to science and engineering. And then we have a session that I'm doing with a colleague of mine. Um on STEM entrepreneurship, people who want to start businesses, who are studying it, not just to get a job, not just sharpen their skills, but to launch their own thing. Mm. I dig the t-shirt, by the way, man. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. no we'll, doubt. We'll definitely get into that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. Good luck. Good luck. I want to start here. I know we kind of broke the ice already, but explain to us what is inspiring about inspiring other people. Oh, man, that's a great question, man. I, I like that phrase. I always say there's something inspiring about inspiring. And when I say that, like, Charles, I think about... When I was a kid, my dad used to always like try to encourage me to like start little businesses and stuff around the neighborhood. He's like, yo, Nehemiah, what you need to do is you need to open a lemonade stand and sell it around the neighborhood. And I would look at my dad like, dad, who am I going to sell it to? Like, there were no kids in our neighborhood, yeah. like, except for my siblings. But he would still be like, yo, what you need to do is you need to start like a, uh, a, a water slide in the backyard and charge kids a dollar to go down. I'm like, dad. I don't think that's safe. Pops was giving you the job. He was giving all that, man. You know how it is. So it was always like that. And then when he came up to me, he said, you know, what you need to do is you need to go into engineering. As I began to think about what I would do as I grew up, I ended up getting into it. I I started um, researching as an apprentice at NASA. That's how uh, it's in my bio. And I loved it. And that was like the first thing that my dad actually was right on. I was like, Dad, you know, I'm so glad you told me to do that. And I'm glad I decided to do that. And as I'm telling him about my experience, I remember him looking at me and he began to share with me kind of like his story of how he started out studying engineering, but Mm -hmm. he didn't finish it. And he went on and and started working and supporting us. And so when he shared that with me, that's when I flipped it on a flex. I said, dad, what you need to do is (laughs) (laughs) you need to go back to get an engineering degree. And so it was sort of like a symbiotic thing where he was inspiring me and encouraging me. And in turn, what I was able to accomplish then inspired him. And that has sort of been the thing that I saw continue throughout the work that I do. Mm -hmm. As I go into schools and I encourage people about what they can do, it sort of gets me the juice, you know, Mm -hmm. to go back into the lab, go back into the office and really put my all into it as well. You talk about your father kind of instilling those little gems in you um, from early on. How did you develop your love for science, technology, and engineering and math? Yeah, man, right there. I give it to my... You memorize that whole job? I just said (laughs) step. Yeah, step was way easier. I didn't know what I did. (laughs) He nailed it. He nailed it. Yeah, man, definitely. um, My pops, he's the one who helped me to put a name to it because I didn't know what engineering was until Mm -hmm. he told me. But man, I always had what you call one of those like junk drawers mm-hmm. in my in my room where I would just keep random objects like mm. broken hangers and like Pringle cans and stuff. You know what I mean? Like I was going to make something great one day. And so I always remember like creating things and my mom would encourage me. And one day she decided to uh, buy me this inventor's workshop kit 
from like a, a bookstore mm -hmm. and i just remember that was like the best toy in the world i felt like that was the toy that like would end my need for any other toys and so i kind of always had it very young it wasn't until i began to realize like oh man people get paid to do this these are these are career paths that are available in tinkering figuring out things creatively combining you know art and math and so that was mm. just kind of really where it came from. from from where we're from you know what i mean like uh lawyer doctor engineer yeah yeah it's kind of what you like force that's what we said breaking the mold into doing yeah was there any other thing you know what i'm saying it was, it was just like yo engineering for you it made it definitely with other things like you know when you're young you just want to have fun yeah for, you know yeah. And, and once you start having fun or once it starts to feel like you're forced to do something and it's not like fun that's when like oh man i don't really want to do this so it was all love for you like yo this is what i want to do yeah yeah it was, it was definitely out of born out of just wanting to have a good time wanting to create something great mm -hmm. being creative um what i would say though about you know having that prescribed path that sometimes our parents say you know you're going to doctor lawyer engineer or whatever that also still you still kind of bump into the walls when you want to do it kind of non-traditionally you know because i'm in a position where I have engineering as a passion, but also entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. wanted to kind of step outside the box. But to people who like know how the path is supposed to go, they'll look at it and be like, yo, now you're supposed to get this job and you just enjoy those benefits and work for like 30, 40 years. But I'm like, yo, no, I, I don't know if that's how my career is going to go. So even though on one hand, you're like, okay, you're an engineer, you check that box. On the other hand, I'm really like not really trying to stay in the mold mm -hmm. as a traditional engineer, if you, if, if you will talk a little bit about your education um you know as regards to stem so you went to north carolina state yeah that's where i get my phd from north carolina PhD state university the, huh? <laughs> <laughs> wow, doctor maybe hey man let me ask you this question though because i saw a tweet yesterday a lady she 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 put it she said if you asked me if my phd was absolutely worth it it wasn't was it uh, worth it for you oh man it definitely was worth it for me i definitely say not because not from what people think though like i think the process sorry to cut you off by the way you know, you know, again, the process that you go through so phd is is a it's a degree program where there is no pres prescribed path for you mm. you know bachelor's degree is like you take all these classes you get your degree mm -hmm. masters you're still also like taking classes and then you may do like a thesis Thanks. which doesn't necessarily have to be like anything novel but you can get that thesis work phd you're required to essentially add new knowledge like you have to go and like create a dissertation on something someone hasn't already done a dissertation on. Mm. And so that being the case, you're basically going into a, a space of unknown and that pulls out of you certain types of characteristics that I don't know if I would have gotten so soon anywhere else, put it mm. like that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the end is. I got to ask this question. I got to you know, comprise or construct a program, experimental process. And just kind of going towards the unknown, I really think develop perseverance and ingenuity and all types of things that I look back and say, mm -hmm. that is what made it worth it. Where were you born? So I was born in like South Georgia. I was born in America's Georgia, super small mm -hmm. town in country uh, Georgia country, man. <laughs> I'm just, I, I told, I was saying Charles earlier, I was like, man, I'm just a black boy from the country. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. From the South, man. And um, How many siblings you got? We have, I have, a, I have there's seven of us in total. Mm -hmm. So I'm the second oldest. Mm -hmm. I have a sister that's older than me, a sister that's right underneath me. And then underneath that sister, the rest are boys. Mm -hmm. And so I always had like four younger brothers that I wanted to play ball with. You went to high school in South Georgia. So I went to high school in Alabama. So my, my dad worked for the federal government mm -hmm. and he moved, we moved to Huntsville, Alabama. And it was there that I kind of came of age. So I started driving the car then. I started, you know, going to high school. Mm -hmm. I started knowing my lay of the land. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I would say I'm from. If someone were to ask me, I would say Alabama. But uh, yeah, man, my formative years were all spent in the South. Now in North Carolina. Do you have any ties? Do you have any ties? You know, if any, to the motherland, to Africa. Oh man, well, obviously some kind of ties to the motherland. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Lady friends, some. Yeah, you know yeah. So, so I'm married, man, and I often say I am Haitian by association. Okay. Shout out to my wife. Jed, I see you. Love you. Yeah. Um, she is actually of Haitian descent. Mm -hmm. Her parents are born and raised in Haiti. They came to America. She was born here. Um, and so I often like. Whenever people were like, you know, repping the flags and everybody, you know, all the flavor yeah, starts yeah, yeah. coming out. I'm like, yo, I, I need a team. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what's my team, you know? And so that's when I linked up, you know, where I start claiming, of course, Haitian my association, yeah, yeah. Um, my wife being from Haiti. So that's that's what I would say is, is my tie. Shout out. Yeah. Okay. 
So I see you have on that shirt, STEM Media. Yeah. Um, does that go ahead and tie in with your entrepreneurship? Yeah, absolutely. It does, man. So STEM Media is um, my company. It's a media company. We provide education and inspirational content for the STEM community, mm -hmm. primarily focusing on uh, college students <clears throat> and recent grads who have already begun the path to a career, to a career in science and engineering and technology, but can often use encouragement, can often use um, educational soft skills and personal development and things of that nature. And so there are a number of ways that we provide this. One, I speak, um, I'm a keynote speaker, do workshops, hence up here for the DC, for the yeah. DC yeah, for the conference. Um, also, we do video production. Mm. And so we partner with a lot of like leading universities, whether it be my alma mater, NC State, University of Texas at Austin, you know, a lot of different universities. VCU, we've done a project with them lately, mm -hmm. lately where we produce creative content all centered mm -hmm. around STEM. And um, lastly, what we're working in and in development of now is building our own platform, our own um, STEM edutainment platform, mm. where we will have both, you know, courses, you know, your documentaries. Your That's content. so strange to hear. STEM, yeah. STEM entertainment, ain't nothing entertaining. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you're changing the narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just, it's kind of interesting. I mean, how did this idea come about? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question too, man. So the story goes, I've always, again, been a person who was stuck in the middle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You have your technical interests. And my stuck in the middle has been the technical and the artistic. You know, being someone who really enjoys the science and the math, but also, for instance, I play the bass guitar. And you do poetry. I do poetry, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I acted a little bit when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And so wanted to kind of merge those things. And at the time, there was no acronym known as STEAM, which is what people say when they say science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. But there was like STEM, which I was into, but also I had these creative interests. So I entered this contest a couple of years ago um, by Intel. It was like an engineering video contest. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people like make their videos where they're sitting down and looking at the screen and saying, oh, you know, I like engineering. This is why I'm doing it. Da, 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 da. But I decided to do was uh, make my own like Nike commercial type mm. for engineering. So I, I got my boy following me around campus and we went on and like filmed it and submitted it. Long story short, uh, MTV was also a sponsor of it. They reached out and was like, yo, are you an engineer? Did you do this? You know, we're expecting something a little more dry, you mm -hmm. know, because that's how all the submissions were. I won it, won a national prize. And from there, that kind of led to people saying, hey, can you make a video for my school? Can you make a video for my, my program? Can you make a video for this, that, and the other? And so I said, hey, man, I guess I need to go ahead and make this a company. What what void does STEM media fill? Like, you know, what is like in the, in the STEM industry that, you know, STEM media, you know, kind of like um, provides a solution for? Absolutely. Well, you just mentioned it when you said, you know, edu uh, entertainment. And, and just to clarify, I use the term edutainment. I didn't make that up, but it's been around for a while when you combine education with entertainment. And what often happens is when you're looking at a field such as math, for instance, mm -hmm. it's presented in a way where it is often dry and people who look like us or people who are used to other things may feel like it has zero relevance. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is a lot of people who have the talent, who have the potential to actually go into these fields and bring innovation are turned off at an early age or turned off in the, somewhere in the process simply because of how it was presented. Thanks. And so I look at it from the standpoint of STEM media being able to not only understand math understand science understand it like literally and know how to teach it but we can come along and present it in a way that is attractive okay. right yeah i mean not to cut you off no you're good it, but um with working with children i see that you also work with um kids age 5 through 12 or 5 through 17 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how do you instill their love for them because with you you know your father was kind of that driving force so yep. how do you in turn kind of inspire those children to fall in love with um, STEM yeah 100% man so media is powerful media is extremely powerful just allowing people to see something um, a quote that says you know you can't be what you can't see and it's simply presenting images that people young kids can relate to and say I can see myself in that person. Hmm. So as you notice, I didn't come here with a suit or anything. I, I mean, I would probably wouldn't anyway, but like if you go into schools and you're trying to basically present something in a way that they can't necessarily see themselves in, then you kind of lost at the very beginning. But if you come in and, and you dress like yourself and you wear maybe, I don't know, some Jordans or whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Whatever it is. And then you also show them an application for this stuff that they like, whether it's uh, fashion or you show application poetry is another example as he brought up. You know, you spit a verse, you drop bars, a couple of bars to them real quick. 
that all of a sudden changes the stigma in their eyes mm -hmm. and once something that was once like unattainable and untangible to them becomes realer to them and now they say okay let me see what it's like to maybe be an engineer let me see what this science thing is all about so that's kind of where it started who's your target audience when it comes to that yeah so really the whole gamut right there's always a need for this with younger kids because that's kind of where your interest first starts but i have also found that i have personally found more effectiveness reaching those who are like in mm -hmm. those recent grads because what happens is there's this thing called attrition rate which basically means people dropping out people starting on a path and then they just kind of leave yeah, all together yeah. right and so coming in to the person who said you remember you liked this when you were a kid and there were certain things that were about this that attracted you don't give up now stay with it right and so target audience i would say is probably um you know late high school to early career professionals sort of that 18 to 35 window and what kind what kind of resources you know uh, i know you, you probably said this in, but just you know lean it out for the artists people watching and listening sure. what kind of resources does stem media offer yeah so again there's there's live events live presentations mm -hmm. so i'm able to be booked at your school we'll have a lot of colleagues who can come into your school we'll do a one we'll have a, a 45 minutes one hour workshop that would just have the kids on fire, whether it's uh, presenting them uh, tenants as it relates to uh, optics, or we'll just pick any su any subject, right, as it relates to STEM. It could be chemistry related, it could be uh, building bridges, which is what my expertise is in. We'll present the topic to them, but also tie in personal development aspects. And so I'll come into a workshop, have the kids lit, have them really engaged. They learn something, they don't even know it. And then after that, we can have a workshop with your, with your teachers. We'll sit down with your teachers and say, hey, here's how you can incorporate these things into your regular lesson plans. So those are live presentations, right? On the other hand, then there's the video production. So if you want to hire somebody to come in and say, hey, we want to produce a school and we got stuff online already. Mm -hmm. We want to produce a school PSA, right? About this new STEM program we have over the summer. We can come in, sit down, script it out, get some videographers and decide exactly how we want to present this thing. So where the video isn't just someone talking in front of the camera, but it actually tells a story right. and presents it like, it, like I said, like a Nike commercial or mm. something that people want to be a part of simply by how it looks. Mm. And so those are the two services mainly. And coming soon again is, is our platform where we will allow people to subscribe to this content and have access on a regular basis. So stay tuned. What's the social? Uh, entrepreneur yeah that's a good question man so social entrepreneurship is just really a name <clears throat> given to entrepreneurship endeavors or people who have a social bent in their in their capitalism or in what they're doing right you're not just concerned with a bottom line but you're also concerned with making a social impact good examples of this today is people who have like uh, like Tom shoes I think you know you buy a pair of shoes and they donate a pair of shoes to people in need like when you integrate a social cause into your entrepreneurship endeavors that is in effect social entrepreneurship and so that's what that's really what I'm saying I'm looking at the stem issue I'm looking at the fact that one you know it's difficult we have people leaving all together though our nation thrives on that type of innovation mm -hmm. two we got tremendous underrepresentation of people of color you know and women in these fields i'm looking at these problems three you're looking at the fact that it's simply under leveraging creativity in the arts looking at those problems and saying hey i want to make an impact in that realm but i want to make money too you feel me mm -hmm. so that's really where it comes down to talk a little bit about um some of the struggles right yeah so let's say you connected with a student mm -hmm. um you know a lot of times when i was in college you know i knew a lot of engineering ma engineering majors who mm -hmm. struggled you know they were mechies uh chemies and i don't i forget the other one <clears throat> when you have someone that loves science but struggles within their first couple of semesters in college with engineering how do you get how do you motivate them to either pick it up or um, do better like kind of talk about that yeah yeah I think people underestimate the power of belonging to a, a a support group right there are a lot of times where I feel flat on my face man in school like flat on my face having a hard time and doubted my purpose but what happens is when you're connected to a couple of other people two three four other people who are also on that path with you or someone like a mentor who's ahead of you and they can say, hey, man, I've been there before. I've seen those numbers before. Yeah, I've, I've gotten a single digit score on my on my test before. You know what I mean? It gives a different perspective because when you're siloed, when you're all by yourself, 
you can often think that something is a knockout blow when it really isn't a knockout blow. Right. And so I believe that there's a, a lot of impact that it simply comes from someone saying, Hey man, I feel you. I know where you at. You know what I mean? Let me tell you this story. And then that kind of gives people the motivation to keep going. And so that's one of the reasons, one of the ways that I say you connect with people. The other thing is it's very practical, man. People got to find tutors. People got to find somebody to explain it to them. I literally remember in calculus class, Charles, not even understanding what I'm seeing on the board. Like I have no idea what I'm seeing on the board. And then I got online and I Googled and I found like some kind of cartoon. I don't know where it was, where I got it from, but it was a cartoon explaining uh, limits, which is what we're going over in calculus. And even though I didn't quite understand how the professor was doing it, uh, that cartoon made a lot of sense to me. And so finding where a person can actually be taught in a way that they understand. Mm -hmm. Because college is one of those things where it's like, they're not always going to care if you're not getting it. Yeah. Like, oh, well, you didn't pass. Mm -hmm. Half of y'all, you decide what you want to do with it. Right? But I think being able to practically say, all right, you didn't learn it here, but here's a person or here's a place where you can actually understand and grasp it. Sure. Well, well, your teachers and counselors, you know, especially, you know, coming from, you know, uh, the demographic that you came from, encouraging minorities in the STEM field. Yeah, so I started out at a um, HBCU, Historically Black College University. Shout it out. Shout it out. <laughs> Oakwood University. Hey, shout Much out. love out there in Hunter, Alabama. And so I was HBCUs out there. in the building. HBCU. Yes, you went to HBCU? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, where Bowie you Bowie State. Bowie State. You All right. Oh, okay. Oh, we <laughs> in the right place. So y'all know how it is, right? Yeah. Like, that... Those places really like develop and affirm you as a as a black person, mm -hmm. really. And like, it's one thing when you go to a school and there's not many of you. And not shout out to people because I've been on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when you see professors that are black that look like you, when you see when your chemistry professor is a person of color, when your calculus professor is a person of color, when you see these individuals, it kind of dispels the myth that you can't be one of them. Mm -hmm because they're literally talking to you every day. And so I wouldn't say that there was necessarily a strategic push for me to go into STEM um, in that environment, but just simply the fact that I saw educated brothers and sisters doing it. You know what I mean? That alone is like, you can't be I what said, you don't see. Can't be what you don't see, man. Yeah. So I got that inadvertently. And so I realized the power of that as I continue to try to bring it even to spaces that don't have it. Okay. Talk about, um, getting started right mm -hmm. step media mm -hmm. how did you was it was there some struggle behind getting started um you know talk about your first couple of months putting it together yeah it's funny because when you know you want to start a company you know you have an idea like we're good with ideas sometimes but literally we don't know like what are the tangible even legal steps it takes so what was happening was after i won that contest i told you about um, the dean at the school was telling everybody, hey, Nehemiah got this company called STEM Media. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't, I don't got no company. This is just something I'm doing for fun. Yeah. And then he told it, and he said it one day in front of like a bunch of like people who could really like take take me up on whatever, right? And so I was like, man, he's telling everybody I got a company. I guess I'm going to figure out how to actually have a company. And so that was when I actually went and started doing research on, okay, I got to take my name, go to the Secretary of State, fill out the form got to get a registered agent there's a um, lot of things online now the information is online but I actually started going through the steps and when I did it, I felt so good Charles flex I was like yo I got a company now and so I start realizing like yo all right what's next then it's about getting customers and so when that first wave sort of died down of hey you won this contest can you do a video for me for a couple hundred dollars can you do a video for me a couple hundred dollars I started to realize hey if this thing's gonna be real and sustained I gotta like market i gotta like put myself out there i gotta get new clients and so that's the part that i had to figure out right how do i start pitching and so i will often try to like, explain to people oh okay i heard you got a company we think about using you what do you do and for like the first couple of months i was like yeah no you know we we make videos and like we make it real cool and it'd be like engineering and stuff and then they'd be like oh well you can you do preschoolers yeah yeah we do preschoolers too and like we figure out you know you you sound like a person yeah, yeah you yeah. just kind of like trying to find what's gonna stick mm -hmm. and so that was a right just trying to find what stick and mm -hmm. drop the ball as a result of not mm -hmm. having clarity and just kind of went through a process of spending more money than i brought in yeah um but when i got to the place where i said hey this is what i do best these are the people that i'm trying to serve things got a little more smoother and it haven't like gotten completely smooth but mm -hmm. that's where it kind of turned the corner
when we talk about you know like you know the science engineering uh math we you know it's always that one extraordinary person like you know kid who you know got accepted at 24 schools yeah. you know <laughs> just you know briefly talk about that one person in all your time of traveling and school and speaking and things like that any kid or person that you've met who's just like a genius or just extraordinary oh just man a brief story or something yeah, well it's not me i say that <laughs> i wasn't that kid um i knew a lot of them were inspired by them but i've had the opportunity to profile and Phenomenal young people, man. Um, one person that comes to mind, his name is by the name of Alan. Matter of fact, he's 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 of Nigerian descent, mm-hmm. and we did a profile piece on him. And he had like some troubles where, you know, he got like kicked out of school. Then he had to go back to Nigeria to stay with his family. Mm-hmm. And then I think he got in some additional trouble, came back, and he ended up working and going to school. And then um, really his story was really interesting because. He went to a community college, and through that community college, he had an opportunity to do a research program at the major university, which is North Carolina State University. When I sat down with this young man, and I realized how smart this guy was, like just how much of a genius this guy was, the way he was able to grasp um, the research he was working on at the time was, I think, electric vehicles and the power grid and things like that. The way he was breaking this down, I'm talking about a young dude, right? Young dude who... On the surface, I'm sure people will probably say, ah, oh, look at his academic record. Oh, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's not he's falling asleep in class. Like he really doesn't know what he's doing. But when you actually sit down and go beneath the surface, you I found that this guy was like a very, very smart, intelligent young man. Shout out to Alan if you're watching this, man. I I think that that was more impressive to me than a person who everyone can say, Oh, I always knew he was gonna be smart. Shout out to people like that as well. It's not to, you know, mm-hmm. dismiss that, but it really stuck with me how Allen in particular was a person who, by all metrics on paper, people would probably write off. But being able to do a piece on him um, through a mentor of his uh, who recommended it, they really just opened my eyes to how much hidden genius is among us, man. Mm-hmm. So that was one person that comes to mind. How does, how does you know, um, STEM compare in the United States and um other nations particularly like the you know africa in your research or whatever you've seen or heard yeah 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 well i don't know how every country or 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 continent or whatever uh measures up but i know that we are trailing we are not leading as you know some people have us to think we are i think about 27th in the world in terms of science and about 29th in terms of math and this is about on in grade school as it stacks up to the entire world mm. so we have as a country have a lot of game to a ground to gain if we in fact want to lead we want to continue to be the leader so what's happening is the innovation and the jobs even are outpacing our ability to, to produce people to fill those jobs mm. we're looking at the fact where within the next let's say 10 years we're going to have millions of jobs in um in big data and computer science but we're only producing maybe a fourth of what we need to fill those those jobs. And so there is a general, even if, if you take the focus off of diversity, there is a general uh, national need to start putting out more people who are able to code, who are able to uh, understand and analyze data, people who are able to operate on a higher level as it relates to the STEM disciplines. So I, I say that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and if we want to stay above, we don't stay out of the 20s as it comes to stacking it with the world uh, we got a lot of work to do where does the united states rank in terms of diversity in stem um and how do we encourage people of color mm-hmm. to be Minority coming women women. Yeah. yeah 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 so I, I don't know if there's like a specific ranking i can point to but i can say that we are underrepresented and by underrepresented when it comes to women um hispanics um, blacks um indigenous peoples you know um what happens is we well what, what the reality is we represent about a third of the population in general however in the stem fields we're only about 15 16 percent so we're not even like equal to the same number that we are in the general population so that's what we mean by underrepresentation. so that being the case i think there is a greater need for us again to present these opportunities to people in our community because very often it's presented in a way, again, that people can't necessarily see themselves in. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to diversity, I think there's a huge there's a huge mind share that we're missing out on as a country by only having a smaller percentage of blacks or women 
in the decision making room right we, we there are perspectives that are needed there are there are people who are stuck in the middle right who mm-hmm. see things from a different angle that if they're not in that boardroom they're not in the decision making room you literally are shortchanging what you can get out of that particular project or product and so that's the value of it i think from a, a, a overall perspective that um we could do a lot better of. i want to end like this um you know, and this is from your side. Why is perseverance important in the STEM field? Oh man, <laughs> listen, man. <laughs> I'm I, like I got like 15 different stories in my in my uh, life that I can point to in terms of perseverance. But um, really, some people, say, someone once said, you know, it's not given to the swift or the strong, but the one who endures to the end. Mm-hmm. So, so in other words, there are so many accomplishments there are so many achievements that talented people don't obtain simply because they didn't stay with it long enough that's it it has nothing to do with their capabilities it has nothing to do with the access but what ultimately uh we a lot of people out is staying with staying the course and so i think in my life how i have failed certain things example my uh exam as relates to engineering exams in that in that area where i failed multiple times and i had cases where i'm like yo i'm about to stop like this is not worth it but then like the next time or the next time after the next time ends up being the thing that turns the corner and so now i can enjoy the benefits and the privileges that come from simply persevering mm-hmm. and so i think perseverance is it is that um test that everyone has to take perseverance anything that's worth doing it's worth fighting for and in order to overcome, in order to win the fight, you have to stay in the fight. So that's why I think it's important. Man. And then my last question. What piece of advice would you give the next person that's stuck in the middle yeah. with STEM? Yeah. Whether it be pursuing entrepreneurship, landing that dream job, or just either enrolling in a college this course. This is in class right now. Like, man, yeah. stumbled like, oh, yeah, man. Just on this episode. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, shout out to you, man. I just want you to know I, I, I see you. I feel you. Um, I've been there. Um, what I would ultimately say is what I just said before. You know, don't give up. Don't give up. You have to see it before you see it. You have to know it before you know it. You have to have it before you have it. So in your mind, you have to keep a clear picture of what you're fighting for, what you're going for. And so even when you're in the lowest of lows and you have those moments where it's like, man, I don't see the next step. I don't really see how I'm going to get past this mountain. If you can still picture yourself holding up the trophy, if you can still picture yourself walk across that stage, I want you to keep that vividly in your mind because that's ultimately what you're going to continue to work towards. Mm. And if you lose sight of that, if you lose sight of that, then surely you're going to be like, okay, then I guess I'm not really fighting for anything. But if you can keep in your mind, you know, this is why I'm doing this. This is where how my mom is going to feel when I finally pass it to her. Or this is how I'm going to feel. This is how the little kids that look up to me are going to feel. If you keep that picture in your mind, that's going to continue to, to drive you forward. And so that's what I would say to um, anybody watching this right now that's in that moment. You got to put some respect on your name, man. It's Dr. 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 Nehemiah Maverick. Oh, what up, Doc? Doc. <laughs> yeah, it's Dr. Nah, hey, listen, man. we have had a pleasure of speaking with Dr. Nehemiah uh, Mabry. You know what I'm saying? Formerly NASA things, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, big money team. Bridge Design Engineering, at Engineering Designer at Simpson Engineering and Associates from Raleigh, North Carolina, here in D.C. for, you know, a couple of days. Stop with us. Kick it with us. Appreciate you coming through, brother. Oh, man. The pleasure's all mine. Yes, sir. Thank you, Flex. Yeah, so I appreciate you, man. Yeah. Listen, if you've had, if you enjoyed what you heard and listen, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the ringer so you get updates every time we drop something new. Co-host Sir Charles in the building. What up, what up? Mind the building. You know what I mean? Hey, this is Stuck in Middle Podcast, SITM Podcast on all social media platforms. Send us an email if you want to be on a couch talk. you got guest referrals. You want to write for us. Hit up the website, SITMPodcast.com. Shout out to AK in Michigan. So, Charles, I'm going to beat you when I see you, all right? <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, hey, this is Tokyo Minute Podcast. And we out. <laughs>